Uh, Jeff, we'll get back to you uh, after your video. Uh, we need to get started here. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, meeting tonight. And uh, if we were doing this in person, we'd ask anybody who was a new member to uh, stand up and introduce themselves. I know we got at least uh, one new member. Angie, uh, you're here. You're a new member. And I don't hear anything from Angie, but I'd like to welcome you to the meeting. So uh, into the Woodworkers Guild. Anybody else who might be a new member, uh, welcome. Uh, I hope everybody's read the newsletter that came out uh, last weekend. And uh, good news, uh, we're going to certainly try to get back to an in-person meeting on uh, June the 17th. Uh, that'll be back at Shriners. We're contacting them, making sure we understand what all the rules are. And we will be uh, observing all the safety protocols that are in place. And uh, I certainly hope that we can get a good turnout at the meeting. Uh, I think everybody will be glad to, to get back and uh, see some familiar faces, at least uh, from the nose up. And uh, I'm sure we'll still be wearing masks at that point for everybody's safety. But uh, get back to the meetings, uh, get the books out for the library so people can bother, uh, borrow them, and, uh, some raffles and uh, toy donations and that type of thing. So. And cake. Uh, Don't forget cake. We promised cake. Yes. And ice cream, Vicki. You promised cake and ice cream. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, we're going to hold Vicki to that, too, by the way. Uh, so that, I that's didn't hear funny. that. What's she going to do? Make a cake? Yeah. She's going to just personally bake a whole bunch of cakes. But no, we will have cake and ice cream at the meeting. Well, that's Welcome wonderful. I'm, I didn't think it would be, but I thought it was going to be not open till August, but that's great. Yeah, no, Shriners are already holding meetings there, and uh, we'll just have to talk to them and make sure we understand uh, what the rules and regs are in uh, their location. Uh, also, well, I would expect way. most of our people, I can't, I can't allude to the ages of our people in the woodworkers guild but i would imagine i'm 65 and i imagine a lot of them would be the group that's in first first priority and would get vaccines and be finished with them i got my second one today yeah well i, I think that's the feeling uh, people feel some confidence going back is uh because we're uh, most of our membership is older and by that time they will have had everybody should have had at least one if not uh both of their shots. So also in the newsletter, uh, we had in there the officers for the upcoming year. Uh, if you looked at that, you'll see a bunch of familiar names and it's basically the same executive board that's been operating together for the last uh, four months or so. Only some positions are, are changing. Uh, I will assume the position of the past president. Vicki Berry is going to be the new president of the guild and Dan Linder uh, is going to be a director of the guild with a four-year term. And all the rest of the people are going to stay the same. So uh, we appreciate all the uh, effort that those people put in uh, attending meetings uh, a week before these general meetings and then uh, working on these projects and coordinating projects and making sure things happen. So appreciate all the efforts of all the officers of the guild. Uh, we're going to have a swap meet June the 12th. We didn't have a silent auction last year out at Faust Park. Uh, we're planning on having a swap meet on a Saturday morning, be from about 9 to 12, be in the parking lot north of where the uh, shop is out there at Faust Park. And uh, everybody can show up, bring whatever you want to buy or sell, see if you can swap it for something else and uh, see if you can unload some stuff and buy some things that somebody else wants to get rid of. We've also got a bunch of used equipment in the barn out there, and we're going to uh, see if we can't get that outside of the barn and uh, put some prices on it and get rid of it. Uh, it's a lot of good equipment. Most of it should be in workable condition, and uh, we'll be working on that and hopefully get a list of that out before the swap meet so you can see what's uh, going on there. Uh, at the swap meet, the guild will not be involved in any transactions except for the equipment that the guild will be selling. So if you buy something from an individual, it should be cash or check. 
or work something out with them. But we're not going to be in the middle of this, and there's no charge to participate. And we're hoping to have some food along about 11 o'clock. And uh, 12 o'clock, it'll officially be over. And by 1 o'clock, we'd like to see everybody out of there and make sure everything's cleaned up and uh, presentable for the park. So that's June the 12th. There'll be more coming up in the newsletters about that. Uh, the storage shed, which we've been talking about for quite a while, is finally coming to fruition. A uh, load of lumber is supposed to be delivered this week sometime and uh, going to be laying out the, uh, the frame, the foundation for it. Uh, it's going to set on a sloped uh, piece of pavement and we're going to have to shore it up, make sure we get a level foundation to build a storage shed. All of that's supposed to be happening this Saturday out there. So uh, stay tuned. We'll keep you filled in on how that's progressing. Uh, I hate to keep harping on it, but I've asked several times for an audio, video, an assistant to uh, help us. When we go back to these uh, in-person meetings in June, we're also going to live stream these meetings. And we're going to do that with three different cameras and uh, it'll live stream to YouTube so people who are concerned about the health consequences can watch it. Uh, it'll get recorded. People will be able to go and later uh, watch the meeting if they want to. But we need somebody to show up at about six o'clock and help Hal and David set up all of these cameras, run all the wiring. You do not have to be a technical wizard to do this. It's run this wire from point A to point B and tape stuff on the floor so nobody trips over it. It's grunt work, it's uh, assistant work and we need somebody to volunteer for that. So if uh, you want to volunteer for that, just send an email to president at slwg.org and we would certainly appreciate it. And we also need somebody to run one of the cameras. Uh, we're going to have three cameras and uh, the person running this one camera, it's basically uh, zoom in a little bit, zoom out, uh, go up, go down as people are talking about show and tell things and simple stuff like that. Uh, again, it's not rocket science and uh, we don't uh, hope to make this a professional looking production with the, uh, the equipment we have and uh, so any errors will be forgiven. So again, if you'd like to volunteer for that, send an email to the president. Or if you have a family member who might be interested in honing their camera skills. Certainly, yeah. And along with that, uh, we have shot another uh, toy build video and it is now on YouTube and been posted onto the website. And uh, we'd like to thank Hal Donovan for his editing of that. Uh, Hal does uh, really nice work on uh, free software. And so uh, appreciate his efforts. Uh, Vicki, you want to cover where we're at on toys? Uh, sure. We had a collection day Tuesday out at Faust Park and had uh, a nice collection. We collected 859 toys. I will say, by and large, the, uh, I don't do the math, 600 of those came from Bill Muth. Um, so we're in good shape on toys, collecting uh, almost 2,200 year to date. We delivered 406 this month, April, because we still have uh, some organizations that don't want as many and uh, don't want any at all yet. So we have a good inventory. Year to date, we've delivered 1,620 toys. Uh, as I said, we've got a few members that are just uh, doing a great job of contributing. Bill Muth is at six, over the 600 Club. Wayne Humphrey is over the 500 Club, and uh, Rich Sanders and Linda Turner have, are both part of the over 300 Club. So we're actually at 25% of our target uh, year to date with 4.5% uh, of our membership who are contributing. So I'm putting out the commercial again that we are certainly looking for more uh, members to participate. As we've said in the past, you do not have to be a, uh, what I would call a real, real expert woodworker, because if I can do it as a wannabe, I know there are many other opportunities for those to make some of the items that uh, 
certainly uh, are, are used at the hospitals and other organizations. So as I said, we're in good shape for our normal deliveries, but um, we'd like to see our members start working on some of our, what we would call our Toys for Tots type items, both Toys for Tots and the new organization we started with this year, LifeWise, have, uh, are looking for similar items, more finished items, usually a little larger items for end of year at Christmas time. Now, we also know that because some of these items might need to be finished, uh, we might have members who'd rather do finishing, or they might have members of their household or friends that would like to do finishing. And what I mean by that is painting or decorating items or adding ribbons or you know, other things that make these really a more finished gift. So if you know that person or want to be that person, uh, we will get some matching up done, but that's what we'd like to have our members working on, I think, um, for the next few months is, is getting ahead of that Toys for Tot and LifeWise uh, request. Um, I think uh, everyone knows that Rick Weitzman took over as chair last month, and we uh, are looking forward to his leadership and certainly looking forward to getting back in, in person of, of our whole program. So that's all I have. Thanks. Oh, it's not. Oh, it's not? <laughs> oh, I forgot. We have a video. <laughs> we got, is that Brian's video? Yes. Yes. So, yes. Yeah, so when we were collecting Tuesday, Brian Ellison came to us and, and said, you know, I've got a great story to share. And I asked him if he would share that on, uh, on our, our meeting. And so we did a video and let's hear it. Okay, David, here it comes. Hi, Brian Ellison. Just want to relay a little story of my granddaughter being in Cardinal Glennon Hospital last month. She was a recipient of one of our toys that my daughter said she had a great big smile on her face and just loved the toy, loved playing with it. When they would go to the playroom and they would bring out the toys, all the kids that got them loved them. They had a wonderful time playing with them. And it just made me feel so good to be a part of the toy drive. Thank you, Brian. I mean, if that's not the best testimony we can get for the goodness that our program does for the area hospitals and organizations, I don't know what else does. So great job, everyone. Yep. Always good to get feedback and positive feedback like that. Makes you uh, head back to the shop and spend another few hours down there knowing you're doing some good. Uh, had a lot of interesting show and tell things in the newsletter again. We certainly appreciate that. We were a little short on show and tell stuff when we shot the video out at uh, last Tuesday at the shop, but we do have a short one here. Hal, you want to play that? Sure. Okay, David. Several years ago, uh, my wife and I made a couple of trips to Alaska, and I got interested in the art of the Northwest and uh, natives of Alaska. And, uh, came back home and got all excited, bought some books on totem poles and that type of thing. And so I probably am the only member in St. Louis that has uh, three totem poles in their basement and two wooden Indians. So I thought I'd bring one of the wooden Indians in and uh, just do a quick show and tell on it. This is from a pattern from Cherry Tree. Uh, got it several years ago, uh, built the, uh, the thing. It's a pretty good looking thing, four feet tall. It's basically a two-dimensional thing. Take a look at it. It's uh, not very thick. But one thing that I've learned uh, trying to do totem poles is if you try to do them in the round and they get very big, they get pretty massive and hard to handle, uh, move around, that type of thing. You need to do them with uh, somebody else around in the shop that can help you roll them over and that type of thing as you carve. But uh, this is a four foot tall pattern. Uh, Cherry Tree also makes an eight foot tall pattern. If you'd like to put one of these in your front yard and be the hit of the neighborhood, I'm sure uh, everybody would appreciate it. But the other uh, Indian I've got is a little different shape. He's got his arm up and saying how. And uh, 
But anyhow, fun project. Uh, you get to use lots of tools, uh, lots of segmentation going on. All of these pieces are separate pieces. All of this is cut and then carved. A lot of carving on here, down through here, into uh, the feet. And the base of it uh, sets on, says cigars on it. Uh, one hint, when you build one of these things, you need to fill the base up with sand after you put the uh, Indian into it to get enough weight to make sure it's not top heavy. This is Wayne Humphrey. Uh, this month, uh, for we're going to be shooting a toy building video to go onto YouTube. And what we're going to be doing is making uh, some hinged animals. Uh, the uh, plans for this are already on the website. But these are cute little animals, pretty easy to make, only requires a scroll saw and a drill press. Uh, you can see what they look like there. And they're hinged like this, made out of three quarter of an inch wood. So they set on a tabletop real easy. There's a set of plans for a dachshund and there's a set of plans for an alligator. And uh, they're basically the same thing, just a different cutout. But uh, look for that video on YouTube. Thanks, Al, David. Uh, that video is on YouTube. Uh, there's photographs on the, the website and the plans have already been on the website. So if you just look under toy plans, uh, you can find those. So pretty easy to make, pretty quick to make and uh, they're a fun little item. Okay, uh, that's all I've got uh, in way of uh, announcements and things. But do check the newsletter. Make sure you're looking at that. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, take the time to go all the way down through the bottom. Toy reports are in there. Other announcements and things uh, sometimes get down toward the bottom. Uh, but there's a, you know, a lot of effort goes into the newsletter. We appreciate Grady for that. And just make sure you check it out. Uh, tonight, our presenter is Jeff Nasser. And Jeff is a pen turner. And uh, we have a video of Jeff turning pins and an explanation from him. And Jeff's on the phone with us. So at the end of the video, we can ask questions. So let's go ahead and roll the video, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeff Nasser. I belong to the Guild. I've been doing woodwork for about 60 years and I've been turning for just over 50 years. And after a hiatus for a while, I, I turned again starting in January 88. So I've been turning continuously for 33 years. Uh, I've turned judges gavels and pepper mills, pins, lidded boxes, and occasionally spindles for staircases and items like that. And uh, I'm tonight gonna show you how to make a pin, a twist, a regular twist pin. This is one pin I make. This is a double sized twist pin. It's called Cigar because it's big, although there are some larger. And the wood on this one, which is the same piece of wood, top and bottom, is called Patagonian rosewood, although it's not a true, true rosewood. And it comes from the southern part of Argentina. And it's one of those woods that I love to use that are very dense. And this one's about 10% denser than water. The kind of woods I use is, for pens would be something like that, if you can tell that's got a feathery crotch figure because that was cut where the tree was growing up and then this diverged into two directions. And the part right in the... This one is Honduras rosewood, which is a true rosewood and comes from Central America. And uh, over here I have uh, some of the finishes. I have a jars labeled like cigar pen and uh, have the parts in there. And this is an egg I made out of Bethlehem Isle or Middle East olive wood, also known as Olea Europa, because I'm a wood collector and have been for decades. 
And every time I get a brand new piece of wood I haven't had before, I'll make an egg out of it and coat it with Danish oil or sometimes glue. And uh, these are the kinds of blanks I have that I make pens with. And these, these two are Middle Eastern or Bethlehem olive wood, also known as Olea Europa. And uh, uh, this is one that that cigar pen was made from. It's called Curape. And uh, this one is one of the, that's a small item for one for one pen. It's called Pink Ivory, and it comes from Central America. I mean, from Central Africa, and it was so valuable at one time they charged for it by the ounce. Not the board foot or the pound, but by the ounce. And uh, this is a wood called Kingwood, which when it's freshly cut is violet and with black streaks. And it's one of the prettiest woods in the world. And it's used some, sometimes to make musical instruments instead of African black wood. And this is, so this is, can be a tonal wood like I just found out it was used to make oboes and clarinets. Now, this is a piece of African blackwood, which is what I'll be turning this evening. And um, it's a true rosewood, a Dalbergia, which has about 26 different species. This one's Dalbergia melanoxin. It's used for tonal woods, bagpipes, clarinets, and even oboes. And it is, I believe, the densest rosewood in the world at about, its density is about 20% over water. Water is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. This is about 75. This one is one of my favorite woods. It's called Madagascar rosewood or Dalbergia maritima. It's magenta when you cut into it with black streaks. The only downside of it, and several of my suppliers have said, please let me know if you figure out how to do it, is this, when UV light hits it, it'll darken it, almost cold, almost black. So what I usually do is make them, coat them, and then stick them in my drawer. And uh, this, is, this is also a nice one. It's called Purple Heart. And uh, it's another one that darkens on exposure. And, uh, but when it's cut and it's brand new, it is often a bright purple. The only wood in the world like that. Other, there are some other redwoods. One of them I have over here is uh, bloodwood. And uh, this, is, this is bloodwood. It's not very big, but it's big enough for one of these pins that I like to make. And it comes from South America, unlike pink ivory, which comes from Africa. And bloodwood, which is no relation to pink ivory, isn't quite as fine a grain, but uh, it also is good for making pins or at, at a certain level, if I get them big enough, I can make uh, items like this. That's a blank for a 14 inch pepper mill. And um, the, the uh, width the square is 2.7 by 2.7. So each one of the three pieces is 0.9 squared. And uh, when I get them together, they all mesh together because they're the same size. And I use about seven clamps to glue them up using tight bond three. And the wood in the center of it is poplar. And the reason I use it, such a common wood as poplar is because it's a soft hardwood. This is not going to show in the final, in the final item because it'll all be drilled out. And so, uh, the, so when I use, when I do that with poplar, um, it it uh, is easier on my drill bits, much easier. And this, I will probably make a small 
pepper mill out of that, maybe six inches high. This is called Brazilian rosewood. And along with pink ivory and snake wood, this is one of the most valuable woods in the world. I have some of it because I got it a long time ago, but I believe it's been off the market since 1995 by an organization whose acronym is CITES, C-I-T-E-S. They regulate what is endangered in terms of uh, plants, animals, and other items and describe at some level how endangered, very endangered, or almost extinct. And since I want the woods to stay around for a long time, I, if something is restricted or off limits by CITES, I respect that. A lot of the uh, preparation for this could be done by a non-turner. That includes selecting the wood, cutting the pieces of wood to size on a bandsaw or table saw, and any drilling that has to be done ahead of time, like this piece over here on the lathe, which is uh, drilled and has a tube insert, a brass tube inserted into it. And the pin that I make in size and shape will end up looking like this. And after I finish turning it, I'll probably put a light coat of uh, glue on it on the outside as a sanding sealer, and then sand it and buff it. And uh, black wood is a oily wood. When I uh, mount this on two bushings, I will turn down as far as the bushings. This, is for, this will get it to the right size. The center diameter, I have, I have variation of what I can do there. I just I like to keep it a certain size. That's, a, that's the pin called the Gadsby Grande. The finished size is about 0.61 in diameter. And when I mount it on here, one of the first things I do, that I learned years ago, is rotate it around so you know that it's going to clear the tool rest. And over here, I have a, that's a diamond honing stone or sharpening stone. I have a grinder, but I usually keep these tools so well in such good shape that I don't have to grind it unless it gets to the point where it uh, is out of shape and I have to reshape it. But to hone it, I do this, just, Now, this is a rather soft steel. I think this is carbon steel. This is an old tool that I got in 1991. It is not high speed steel, but it does take a good edge because being softer, it's almost like the material in a razor blade. And I can make this whole pen blank and with two tools, maybe three, but this is a skew chisel. It's got an eye, it's got an edge like that. You can now you see the profile of it and it's like down, cut down like this. It's just like a chisel, except it's at about a 15 or 20 degree angle from the, uh, from the straight edges of the chisel. And I, with that, I do the same thing. I use a lot of sandpaper, but usually with the uh, items I make, I have, I have, I've had enough experience that I can start sanding at about 600, 600 grit, which is, I used to consider very fine sandpaper. Now for me, it's the low end. And I will start with 600. And if I put a glue finish on something, I can start, uh, I can smooth it off with a skew chisel, start at 800 with Danish oil and wet sand it. Danish oil is just, it's not Danish, but it is an oil that's similar to tongue oil, except uh, Danish oil is a man-made product. Tongue, tongue oil is a natural product, which never cures. 
And if I want to, I can just use water, just bring a bowl of water over and soak the, uh, the small pieces of sandpaper in the water because wet sanding gives a finer finish. And uh, the sandpaper I have now goes from to 2,000, 2,500, 3,000, 4,000, 7,000, all the way up to 10 and 12,000 grit, which is about the, about the abrasiveness of a piece of paper towel. Okay, this is the dial calipers I use when I measure things. And this can measure down to uh, a thousandth of an inch. And just for a frame of reference, when I first got a pair of these when I was a teenager, I measured a shred of a strand of hair. It's two thousandth of an inch thick. So um, these work pretty well. And uh, so what I can do to make something like this is use about three tools to get it all turned. The, the roughing gouge, the skew, and to see when, periodically how thick it is, I will get down to uh, uh, just over 0.61 and then get some, uh, some pieces of sandpaper, which are right over here. Now, this is a pack of sandpaper that I've already cut up. I have a, I have a drawer full of sandpaper. And what I use starts at about 220 or 320. Now, these are piece, pieces that start at 800 grit, which is pretty fine itself, and go all the way up to 10,000. And I won't put much glue finish on this piece of wood because this piece of wood, African blackwood, is very oily. And what I will do when I finish is uh, at the, after I finally sand it, I will take it off and jam a buffing wheel, which is right here. And that will rotate. And even without rouge, which is something you put on the buffing wheel, I can get a pretty nice shine out of it. So if we're all ready, I will start the machine and turn this down. It should take between five and 10 minutes. Now the bushings uh, are rotating almost true so that I can't see any wobble in the bushings. So I'll start to take off the wood right now. Now when I've done it for a few seconds, I'll lift this uh, tool rest and push it a little in further. So I want to get as close as I can because that makes it easier and less likely to uh, catch, which is a negative idea in the lathe because if it catches, it may throw the tool in the wrong direction and leave the wood damaged. Sometimes I'll put my finger on it when I feel a, uh, a rough spot. In fact, I'll turn it off right now. That means some part of it is still flat. And there it is right there. If you can see that, that part is still flat. And so I just go back to turning it on. Now the flat is gone, so what I'll do is come over here and see how much left I have. I want to get this down to 0.61. And right now, I'm just about there. I have to go 20 thousandths more. So what I'll do now is take a little more off here. Try to get near the bushing, but not too close. It's the same on this side. Now 
and now take the, the skew chisel. And take it down on the far left just so it meets the bushing. And I just smoothed it off, so I still have about 10 thousandths more to go. This kind of tool shaves so fine, but uh, I can take a few thousandths off at a time. So I just keep measuring it until I'm satisfied that uh, it's where I want it to be. A few more thousands of an inch to go. That's where I'll stop. That's 10, that's 0.61, which is just about a little less than five eighths of an inch thick. Now I'll go into this pack right here. Let's see if I can find, I'm looking for a grid 800 just to uh, smooth it off a little bit. Now when I do the sanding, I pull the, one of the first things I do is pull away the uh, the drill, the tool rest, so I don't get anything on my hands. be putting a thin a thin uh, coat of uh, cyanoacrylate glue fast drying uh, CA glue on it and I have a I have a piece of uh, paper towel already and I'm not going to put much on this one this is the thin glue there's the medium and there's thick thick is almost always used just for gluing the medium is used, I use for finish. And the thin one I use mainly just as a sanding sealer. So I'm gonna do this and then start sanding. And for that, I will lower the lathe speed to about a um, thousand RPM or less. And it goes on, this is where I need glasses. This is accelerant and I spray this on here like that and probably put on one more coat of it. After that, this is a uh, I can touch it now and feel that it's uh, 
it's hardened. And I'm gonna get one more piece of sandpaper, a little heavier, grit 600. This is Watco Danish oil. It's a popular finish, but what I do with it is uh, put it on sandpaper just to use it as a wet, to wet sand with. Now I'm going to pour it over in this direction because I have a lot. I have a lot of sandpaper. I have a lot of newspaper over here, so if it falls on the floor, the newspaper will catch it. And I just coat all the, the piece of sandpaper with it. And once I have that ready, I fire it up again to about 3,000 RPM. You notice I'm trying to get everything, and the reason I put my left hand underneath it is uh, the more I sand it, the smoother it feels until if there are any slight holes in it. This is a very fine-grained wood, but even it has a little, a few holes in it, so what I just do with that is just Now I'm going up to another level. This is 800. This is what I usually start at. But I didn't put the tool back on the blackwood because I didn't need to. Normally I wouldn't jump around in grits like this, but this time I think I will jump to 2000 grit. Normally that's the highest grit you can buy at any local stores. To get anything higher than 2000, you usually have to go online or go to a specialty shop where they actually make this kind of a level sandpaper. Now that I've sanded it, grab a piece of paper towel and get the cleaner side of it and wipe this off. And the reason I'm grabbing it is because the more I grab that, it gets, starts to get warm. Now I'll step out of the picture for a minute. I'll show you, this is how much it's taken off. That's how much I've gotten off of it now. I'm gonna get one more paper towel and use something that will polish it as a friction polish. It's called Hut Crystal Coat. Craft Supply sells it and it's very popular for this thing. First thing I do is just shake it good. Make sure I can, hasn't closed up on me. And then put some on the, on the paper towel or on the outside like this. Now this also is taking a little bit of the, the sawdust off of it, that's why it's dark. Ideally, it should get to the point where it's not taking any more off. So all it does is polish it, and it's called a friction polish because, see, this is a little less, less dirty. 
and the less dirty it becomes, the closer it is to ideal. So I'm gonna try this once more. Put it on like this and hold it on this time myself. And with so much patent towel between this and my fingers, it's not gonna get too hot, but it is a friction polish. And if you, you, you grip down on it medium hard, you'll notice it starts to get warm. Now what I've done now is jammed a, a buffing wheel in it. If I really wanted to be precise, I'd put some kind of rouge on it, but the, I don't think I need to. You don't wanna move the the RPM too high because if you if the RPM is too high and this gets too hot it will melt the glue. I found that out a few times the hard way. And there's what it looks like. Okay, this is the spring that will go into, into the pin on the cartridge because it's spring loaded. There is nothing in this whole kit that is easier to lose because if you hold it the wrong way and flex it, it springs and is so little that uh, it's, it's for all practical purposes gone. Now the other parts come separately wrapped Here's the, uh, this is the point. That's the front end, that point. And this is the cap that goes in the rear end. This is the, uh, this is what the point screws onto. And right here, I have the clip, which will go over the top of the rear. And that's what you would put in your pocket to hang the pin on. Now I've told people before, if you turn these things, look and see if there's an eye, if one side looks better than the other because they're the, they happen to be the same size, so that doesn't matter. So what I'll do, and they look about the same. There is one thing I'll add. This is especially true with exotic woods. I take a rat tail file because there may be some hardness, some, um, it may be stiff inside. I wanna make it a little wider and get off any burr that may have come when I drilled it. So what I'm doing here is widening it just a, probably under a thousandth of an inch on the side where my thumb and fingers are. And then I do the same thing over here. This isn't so much necessary with a wood like African blackwood, but it is necessary with woods that are either harder or when I hold this, what's left and right between my thumb and forefinger is the direction of the grain. Now, being what I am, I'm adventurous enough to try turning it across the grain because it gives some woods an absolutely wild look. Trouble is, when the grain goes like this, it's also more likely to crack. So now I'm ready to start Assembly. Now, 
this is an old fashioned vise right here that I'm using. They do sell tools just for this purpose to assemble this, but I never, I never use them. This is the, uh, the clip that goes up top. Now this will have the clip in it where you can put it on your pocket or your, or whatever else you want to hold it by. And the, the, the method is the same here. Just screw it in until it's snug. And now I'm going to screw the top on. So it's, that's done. And here's the cartridge. And as I said before, be careful with the, uh, the, the spring. It actually is wider at the base. It has a wider end and a thinner end. So I push it in like this. And this is what holds it. And this is actually the twist mechanism. So it'll come out like that. And on top of it goes this. And whammo, that's a finished pen. This is the completed pen. And right at you, the, the twist part is at the very bottom where my right hand is. And if you, you twist it, and then you can notice the pen, the tip comes out at the left end where my left hand is. It's, uh, the trim is gold, which I thought would look gold with, good with black because the piece of African black wood is coal black. And, uh, and so what I'll probably do is take that home and give it to, eventually give it to somebody or sell it or uh, provide it for somebody for their birthday because I've got over a hundred pins that I've turned in the time I've made pins. Now, before we finish, I am going to do one more thing and that's get a, a few pieces of the world's hardest woods. Let my, let my photographers here grip it. This is lignum vitae. Lignum vitae, the genuine article is now off the market, but I think I can still get it. I have a big block of it down below where I keep other woods. There's lignum vitae. That's about 330% denser than water. Heavy. And about, as de about uh, twice as dense as white oak. And this is, let's see. Now this wood in, in my right hand is Brazilian rosewood. And from the look of it, this wood has been off the market since 1995. It's one of the most valuable woods in the world. And it's, this was probably cut up from a piece of furniture. And this wood, which is about as dense as lignum vitae, is called snake wood. When it's cut up, it is, in my unqualified opinion, probably the prettiest wood in the world because it looks like leopard skin and is sometimes called leopard wood. Now I'll let Bill hold it. And oh, a piece of steel. Yeah, that's there are wood about, about ten woods called iron wood. Ironically, that's not one of them. It's tough to work with because it's splintery mm -hmm. and uh, and it. It, when it's cut, unless you coat it quickly, it may start to check and crack. And if you notice, that's all covered in wax. I see. And that's about it, gentlemen. It's a, a very, very good, Jeff. We appreciate it. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Jeff? Jeff, tell us about the lathe you use. That lathe I bought in 99. And uh, just for uh, reference and chronology, the first lathe 
I got in 69. That was a Delta, standard duty. The one I use now, which is uh, 21 or two years old, is called One Way. It's from Canada, and it weighs about 850 pounds. And I can turn a small table on it, at least in three parts, the base, the shaft, and the top. So it's so heavy that it will... uh, It'll turn items like that without vibrating, at least not too much. And it's uh, multi. It's uh, got a two horsepower motor, and uh, it's uh, electronic controlled speed. So I don't have to change pulleys. Where can we buy your pens? You just talk to me. <laughs> Okay. You don't have a website then? I don't. Uh, it's never occurred to me to do that. I uh, um, Usually I, I, I sell them to people who are uh, I just are acquaintances with or I give them away as presents on special occasions. This is my hobby. I'm not a professional because... Uh, I think the main and the biggest reason of all is to be a professional, you have to insert one thing that I'm not very good at, time. To You have to be much faster at spinning things out than I am. Or much quicker. What's the range of pricing for the pen kits? Uh, pen kits can go anywhere from seven dollars to about forty-five, and usually forty-five dollar pen kits are much bigger. They may have some uh, valuable wood, like I mean, valuable metal, like iridium. And uh, any any pen, any two, if there's any two pen kits that are offered in rollerball or fountain pen, the fountain pen will cost more. Why is that, Jeff? Well, fountain pens are just more fancy. Okay. They're just fancier to make. I I rarely make them because uh, I just don't I just don't need them. Okay. Jeff, this is Jay Nofsinger. Uh I've turned a lot of pens and uh, tool handles and of uh, various kinds and so on, always using woods of various kinds. Uh, I think ladies a lot of, uh, like um, acrylic and I've never done one in acrylic. So if, you, if you've done those too, uh, so what are some of the differences? For instance, I find it, find it hard to believe that you can use the same turning tools, but that's what I'm told that you can, you can or the same drill bit to at, drill the initial hole to accept the, the piece of uh, the round piece of metal. Um, and some people will say you need to cut the four corners off um, to, to soften them before you start uh, doing any turning. And uh, so just, and then sanding, uh, you might need different things then too. You have experience? With, um, acry- yes, I've turned, acry- I've turned acrylics before. And sometimes I've turned wood, which are shot full of acrylics just to uh, give the wood an extra amount of stability and make it less likely to crack. So here's my my experience with acrylics. You get get them as large, a little bit larger than you need. Make sure you drill them accurately so the the, uh, drill hole will be centered and drill it at a low speed because a higher speed will will may get too hot and may crack the acrylic blank. And then when you're ready to turn it, you first, and then you, uh, you insert the tube. You get it down to about the same length of the tube. And, um, and I paint the tube with the heaviest and most thick glue and just, just jam it in because it's a little, it's a few thousands less than the hole in size. So it should go right in. Then uh, uh, face it off with a facing tool so that the acrylic and the tube will be exactly the same. 
and then that will create a burr. So I take a rat tail file and get rid of the burr. And then uh, now that I've got the blank ready, I go, I go to a table saw, turn the table saw blade to 45 degrees and do just what uh, you were mentioning a few minutes ago. Cut it off so I essentially have an octagon where the outside of it is gone because that makes less turning. And I I uh, use uh, either a spindle gouge or a small, very small bowl gouge. But the main thing with with lathe tools is sharpening them. You want you always want them to be sharp because a, a dull lathe tool is is not going to be any good for your work. So um, and the the acrylic is harder than most woods. But a hard, but a hard, uh, high-speed steel tool with a sharp edge on it will cut it pretty well. And once you get it down, uh, what I and like I did in the uh, in the tape, you, when it's a, like ten or twenty thousandths oversized, I'll take a skew to it. The skew is the uh, it looks like a chisel except it's at an angle. That's the best way to describe a skew. And then um, and hit that with a, a sh- sharpening stone, and then go go to it and uh, cut it off and make sh- little shavings of it until I finally got it down to the diameter I want. And then I can, uh, since it's acrylic and not wood, I can start right away at 800 grit or higher and uh, use wet sandpaper, either use water or uh, Danish oil on it. And you take it up as high as you want, but you don't have to put glue on it because the glue is an acrylic finish. And uh, there, I, there is a finish for this, which just pol- which is essentially a polish, and makes it get uh, shinier and shinier. Mostly, what I use, I do mostly acrylic. I make my own acrylic. And I have some uh, old carbon tools that I use, <clears throat> keep them good and sharp. And I find it's I find doing acrylic is so much easier than than the wood is, and I can turn acrylic a lot faster than I can wood. Wow. When you uh, you said you said you have old carbon tools, I have a few that I bought at that period of time. What I know about Oh, high, uh, high carbon steel is what it used to be called. Right. They because they're softer steel, uh, like a razor blade, they will actually take a sharper edge. The higher speed, the high speed steel is harder steel, and uh, it'll hold an edge much longer. But it probably cannot be sharpened down to the edge that old. Uh, Harvard, I, carbon steel well. I sharpen mine. I I treat those like I do my normal wood carving tools, and I just I put them on a leather uh, leather strop, and uh, and sharpen them that way. Now, if you could do that, that's pretty good. That's a cut above my grade because mm-hmm. I have never used a leather strop uh, to sharpen anything. The first time I ever saw one was in a barber shop, <laughs> and. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if if you think that if the leather gives you a finer edge and it works all to the good, I there's uh, when I was in a club in a, another city I used to live in, guys would argue about something and uh, different ways to do something and cut and turn until finally one of them cut right through it and says, "Do whatever works best for you." That's right. That's right. Do what you feel comfortable with and what works for you. You know? Yeah, there's no, uh, there's there's no right or wrong way of doing it. I would say there's there's no right way or wrong way, except you need sharp tools. But right. uh, um, as far as uh, turning, um, you want to turn if you're going to turn something fancier. You don't you want as little tear out as possible. So you don't want to use a scraper. You want to learn to use. Uh, uh, ga- gouges, detail gouges, and even bowl gouges on spindle. A spindle is something like a baseball bat. It's held at both ends, and you turn it, and it's held 
unlike a bowl, which is just held on one end on the headstock. But uh, so and uh, I found I've had learn how to use a skew. Excuse me. Uh, you <laughs> one thing you want to really learn how to do really well is learn to use a skew. Yes, that's one of the most uh, irritable tools I have ever found. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of practice uh, to learn how to use that thing. I know how to do coves with it, and I can uh, I can run it along the edge of a of a smooth edge like a pin all the way up to something as big as a baseball bat. What I don't like to do with it is turn beads. Oh, to yeah. turn beads, if you, you got to be really good and really experienced to do that. And the, the best way to do it is just take a cheap piece of wood, pop it on the lathe, and just do it until you get good at it. But for when I cut beads, I use a, a detail gouge. Because mm -hmm. I've gotten to the point now where I know I keep the bevel on the on the wood, and that way I don't have any cutouts, tear outs, or catches. Right. Do you mean what's your favorite wood to turn? Oh, yeah, I don't think I have a favorite wood. <laughs> it's I, I it's got, all right I, that you use most often. Oh I use I, like I said, I a lot of mine's acrylic. And I've uh -huh. and and I I just whatever I can go and buy and scrap around and find. I've I've made uh, I've made pens from woods from people's trees in their front yard that were cut down for a uh, um, um, uh, mementos farm. Um, <laughs> made pens out of a fence post that somebody had there in their front yard forever. <laughs> Wait till somebody ask you this. They have a a barrel that held beer that held beer in it, and uh, they want to finally. Cut it up, and just as a memento, they want you to turn a pen out of a, a piece of barrel that once held beer. Oh, <laughs> now now I've done Jack Daniels. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Barry, Barry Gross, a couple of years ago, he had uh, a whole bunch of that stuff from a, a Jack Daniels barrel, and I bought uh -huh. a bunch of that, and that was nice. Yeah, you didn't want to you didn't want to put glue in on you didn't want to put glue on that. For a finish. No, you just like <laughs> the, the beer is already there. It's in. It's probably insert. It's uh, all the way in the wood. Yeah. And you get a fantastic smell out of it. Yep. So you mentioned lower RPMs with acrylic. So give give me an example. Yes. Range. Oh. RPMs with well, acrylic. One thing I learned a long time ago is, uh, especially if you're drilling a hole. Don't drill it fast and keep pulling that drill bit out because it will get hot and it will get locked up inside your your blank. And it's that's exactly really right. <laughs> I I have one of those downstairs in my shop that for for my memento is drill slow. <laughs> well, um, oh, and another thing. Uh, so I don't know if you, what kind of drill bits you use, but I don't, I use almost nothing now but brad point, which right. goes up to about just over an inch, like thirty millimeter. An inch is an inch is twenty five point four uh, millimeters, and I have brad point long drill bits that go up to thirty. But Forstner bits, I started about you know, seven eighths of an inch and go up to two and a half inches. And that's what I drill the bottom part of a of a pepper mill for, where the yeah. mechanism goes, and then I may make the hole all the way up through the the body of the pepper mill around an inch, and then uh, uh, all I need to go in the knob at the top is about one six seventeen sixty four. So that's just over a quarter inch, and that lets the uh, pepper mill mechanism. Uh, protrude out the top where I can put the little knob, the little screw knob on it. But yeah, with uh, all I use when I do when I do pens and stuff, I use all Brad pits. A Brad point. So that's what yeah, I do. Brad that points. way it won't it won't wander. Right, right. 
And it's a truer hole too. Yeah, that's that's been my experience since I went to whatever year I can't I can't remember what it was. I started using Brad points. I just I just don't go back to um, a little um, the regular twist drill except for the very small ones. I do, and this has nothing to do with pins. But when I when I make pepper mills, there has to there have to be four little holes, two in the bottom, and two in the tenon that goes goes into the body and the top that have to be pre bored. And I use about I just put a mic to the uh, the screw, the little screws that'll go in and take the next. Uh, next grade lower, just a little bit lower than that, and I I'll drill in the tenon is that is almost always maple. That's all I use, but the bottom will be whatever exotic wood that the pepper mill is made out of. And exotic woods are not too friendly with um, dr- drilling straight. Uh, you have to always pre bore them. Yeah. Jeff, uh, what speed do you run your lathe at when you're turning acrylics? Uh, I start out lower because I don't want to chip it too much. So I would say uh, around five to 700 RPM. Yep. And then when you get it higher and higher, you can, because uh, you're getting down to where you don't have parts that chip so much, partly because you've already cut off the corners. You you can raise the speed, and then finally, uh, I think I go up to 2,000 when I run the skew across it to finish it and get get a smooth edge on it. Okay. Well, Jeff, thanks very much for the uh, presentation on pin turning. I think uh, everybody can learn something, and if you didn't learn something about pin turning, you probably learned something about exotic hardwoods. We appreciate your time. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a, it was my pleasure. All right. Well, that concludes tonight's meeting. Unless somebody's got something else they need to ask a question about or uh, any comments or anything. And if not, uh, we'll see you next month. Good night. Good night. Have a good day. Good night.